7 in the Bible. We went through a lot of different things. I'm not going to repeat all that. I'm going to start with some other new things tonight. And uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of different sevens in the Bible. And uh, we went through seven names for Palestine. <clears throat> Jehovah is seven times in the Bible. The expression men of God is 14 times, which is seven times two, of course, in the Bible. Seven titles of Jesus in Hebrews. Seven titles given to Jesus Christ in the Pentateuch, and we went through the seven baptisms, the seven baptisms, and, uh, and then uh, tonight I want to go through some other different things. There are seven mysteries. We'll start with the seven mysteries in the Bible. We went over this in our verse-by-verse -verse study in Revelation and 1 Corinthians and I forget other books that we've taught uh, through the years. But there are seven mysteries. Uh, the first one is the mystery of the incarnation. Incarnation of 1 Timothy 3.16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And that's a mystery because to try to understand how God could be a little baby and need the diaper change and all that. I mean, honestly, you think about that. That's why it's a mystery. I mean, Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. And he was born... Uh, the Virgin Mary, and he was a baby. Yeah. So he needed his diaper changed, and he, he grew up, and he was 12 years old. He was in the, in the uh, temple uh, disputing with the lawyers and the doctors and everybody, and uh, he's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Yeah. And so uh, the mystery of the incarnation. And then there's the mystery of the indwelling Christ. That's in Colossians 1.27, and uh, Colossians 1.27 calls it a mystery. And Colossians 1, verse uh, 27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a mystery how that Jesus Christ can come inside a person's body at the time of conversion. Yeah. Now we preach about it, we know it's true from the Bible, but to think about how that God comes inside of you when you repent and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Yeah. And you're born again at that second, that moment you repent, you believe from your heart, that transaction is done, it's made. You pass from death unto life. Yeah. And uh, to think about how big, somebody so big as God can come into somebody so small as you and I. Yeah. And that's why 2 Peter 1, 4 says that we have been made partakers of the divine nature of God. Yeah. When you get saved, God comes inside of you, and you have God in you. And that's why when you do something or wrong or say something wrong, you're convicted, you feel bad, yeah. because you have God in you. Yeah. And you're, uh, you have the indwelling Christ. All right, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a mystery, Colossians 1.27. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his, Romans 8, verse 9. Thirdly, the one, mystery of the one body. The mystery of the one body, Jew and Gentile in one body. That's found in Ephesians 3, 1 to 8, and Ephesians 5, 30. Ephesians 3, 1 to 5, Ephesians 5, 30, the one body, Jew and Gentile in one body. All right, that's what uh, the Lord was trying to show Peter in Acts 10 when he said, go to Cornelius, a Gentile. Peter said, nothing doing, I'm not going to him, he's unclean. God said, what well, I've cleansed, don't you call unclean. Because God was going, taking that gospel to the Gentiles. Yeah. And, uh, you know, up until then, you know, the, the Jewish people, they hadn't eaten all those things that they, they come down in the uh, sheet and all that, the knitted sheet that God, uh, come, God had come down from heaven. God was trying to show that the dietary laws, Peter, are no longer in existence. We're going to the Gentiles. Yeah. And for hundreds and thousands of years, it would have been that way. No wonder why Peter said, I'm not going to a Gentile. He's unclean. Because that's the way it had been for many, many, many years. Yeah. See, but God, there's a transition period in the book of Acts, as I've said a thousand times, and God's going from Jews to Gentiles, from Israel to church, to the church. Yeah. And it's a progressive, gradual thing. Yeah. Uh, number four is the uh, mystery of the uh, restoration of Israel, the wandering Jew, 
Romans 11, 25. Uh, the mystery there. Uh, Romans eleven twenty five. 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So there's a temporary setting aside of Israel when they rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. All right, 2,000 years ago, the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Now, according to Romans 11, we're at the very end of the church age, and we Gentiles were grafted into the olive tree, Romans 11, because the natural branches, the Jews, rejected their Messiah, Jesus Christ. He came into his own, his own received him not. Who's his own? His own is the Israel. All right, this Bible is written by Jewish people. People say, somebody started many years ago that Luke was a Gentile. Luke's a Jew. Every writer in the Bible is a Jew. Jesus Christ was a Jew. Oracles of God are committed to the Jews. Romans 3, verse 2. Oracles of God, this book, Bible. Oracles of God are committed to the Jews. You get the Jew in the proper place, you get your Bible right. And the reason why people have false doctrine in churches all over America, all over the world today, is they don't rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. The Bible has proper divisions. Yeah. And failing to recognize that, you'll have your Bible all messed up yeah. and, uh, and teach false doctrine. And that's what you have going on in a lot of churches and religions today. Uh, the, so the temporary setting aside of Israel, however you want to call it there, Romans 11, 25, it's a mystery. Uh, Israel will be restored, though, at the second advent. They have to endure to the end of the tribulation. Uh, Rome, uh, Matthew 24, that Jew, you pray that your flight be not in the winter. Uh, if you're on the housetop, don't go back in the house and get your stuff. All that in Matthew 24, that's doctrinally to a Jew in the tribulation. We've already been raptured. Lord. We've already, we're already out of here. When Matthew 24 takes place doctrinally, we're already out of here. But yet you've got people in churches all over Highland County and all over America that use Matthew 24, 13, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. They put that down on a Christian today in the church age, doctrinally, and say a Christian has to endure unto the end, or they're, they die and go to hell, they don't get saved. They're, you know, they won't they have salvation. Yeah. That's wrongly dividing the word truth. Yeah. We're to rightly divide the word truth. Yeah. See, they that are unlearned and unstable rest the scripture to their own destruction, Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 16. So what happens is they re resting the scripture is taking a verse, that verse, that part of that verse, that verse, that verse out of context, that verse out of context, putting them together and concocting this doctrine or for a religion or a church or a denomination that damns people's souls to hell. Yeah. And since the average person in America could care less about the Bible and could care less about reading and studying the Bible, every spiritual Joe that comes around down the road and quotes two verses of Scripture out of context they're sucked in by it because they don't know the Bible because they don't read and study the Bible. Yeah. They're on the internet eight hours a day. Yeah. They're on Facebook. They're on, you know, for hours a day. I mean, I heard, I heard, of, uh, I seen a sign in front of a church the other day that said, do you spend as much time in your Bible and on your knees praying as you do on Facebook? Yeah. 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 That's what it said on the church sign. Uh, the seven mysteries. Number five is the uh, mystery Babylon the Great, the great religious whore. Revelation 17, 5. Revelation 17, 5. The mystery Babylon the Great. It's a combination of Catholicism. It's not just the Catholic Church, but it's also other denominations and things uh, intermingled with it. We went over that in our verse-by-verse -verse study in great detail. Revelation 17 and 18. That's Revelation 17, 5. The mystery battle of the great. Number six is the devil incarnate. The uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. And uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. For the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed. That's the Antichrist. And the Lord shall consume the spirit of his mouth. So there is the, the mystery of iniquity. That's the devil, the incarnate uh, Antichrist showing up. And uh, the mystery of iniquity. 2 Thessalonians 2.7. And then, of course, there's the mystery of the rapture. 
That's 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. You're going to be changed. You're going to get a new glorified body. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. So that's seven mysteries. All right, next. There's seven churches in Revelation. If you don't get all this written down, everything you get, there's, you'll end up being a four tape, four CD set in it. Two a couple weeks ago, two tonight, uh, two messages. Uh, there's seven churches of Revelation. And these seven churches, I mentioned, as I go over in a verse by verse study in Revelation, they represent seven periods of church history in the last 2,000 years. These seven churches represent churches back 2,000 years ago, historically. They also represent seven churches. They can represent seven churches today, all right, the kind of churches there are today. You can make spiritual application. But they also represent seven periods of time in church history. There's Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. There's a time period, approximate time period in these churches. All right, first of all, there's Ephesus. That's the apostolic church and uh, in Revelation 2. And that's uh, from about 33 to 200 A.D. 33 to 200 A.D. The Smyrna church is in Revelation 2. That's the martyred church. The martyred church. We're not going to go through and read all this and go through all this stuff again but about these churches. But the Smyrna church is the martyred church. That's about 200 to 325 A.D. 200 to 325 A.D. And in our verse-by-verse -verse study in Revelation a few years ago here, I go through and tell why, uh, what these words mean, Smyrna and Ephesus and Pergamos and why they represent seven periods of time in church history. Uh, then thirdly is Pergamos, uh, the imperial church. That's 325 to 500 A.D. 325 to 500 A.D., that's Pergamos. Thyatira is the medieval church. That's 500 to 1,000 A.D. And, uh, and then Sardis church is the persecuting church. That's 1,000 to 1,500 uh, A.D., uh, a lot of people were martyred. Uh, John Huss was burned at the stake. Savon Rolla was burned at the stake. Uh, Martin Luther, who started the Lutheran Church, he came out of the Catholic Church in the 1500s because he got light on the fact <clears throat> that you're saved by grace through faith. And he nailed his 95 thesis. 95 thesis is he found 95 things wrong. This isn't my opinion. I'm not being mean. I'm not being hateful. I'm not cutting down other people's religions. This is, the, this is exactly what happened. You won't find this in the public school system because the public school system is pro-Catholic. Yeah. And the news media is pro-Catholic. Yeah. It's anti-Bible believing, but it's pro-Catholic. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen, buddy. Bunch of nuts. The persecuting church... 1,000 to 1,500 A.D. When I say nuts, I'm talking about the news media. And uh, he said, I never heard that. I know you never will in the, in the public school system and in the news media. You know, who, you know who they just showed during Christmas? You know who was on worldwide? You think I was? You think they had me on television preaching? You think they had any Baptist preacher? You think they had a Methodist preacher or a Pentecostal preacher? Or a Lutheran minister. No way, baby. The Pope. Yeah. I thought we weren't supposed to show partiality and discriminate. Why do you show partiality towards one religion? Yeah. Amen. Uh, the sixth church is Philadelphia. That's the Reformation and Revival Church. That's 1500 to 1900 A.D. approximately. The new version started coming out in the 1880s, 19, early 1900s. That's when the last 120 years is when the new version started all coming out, corrupting the body of Christ. Yeah. 1884, the RV, 1901, the RSV, 1946, the new ASV, the NIV, which a lot of churches are using, the new international version, that came out in the late 70s, early, not early 80s. A lot of your churches in Highland County, all over the country, Use that. The preachers use it. Sunday school department uses it. New international version. 
It omits 17 verses in the King James Bible. Yeah. And you won't find the word hell anywhere in the Old Testament. Hmm. And the word hell several times uh, in the Bible in the King James. Well, I've gone over that. I got the CD on the NIV. This guy here from Dayton, Ohio, he wants five CDs on that. Yeah. People are very ignorant about these things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Philadelphia Church is when we had more revival and more uh, missionary endeavors, evangelistic revivals and everything, 1,500 and 1,900. But what I was saying about uh, Martin Luther, Martin Luther got light on the fact that the Catholic Church was not right about the plan of salvation and really a lot of things. And he come out and nailed his 95 Thesis to a, a Catholic Church in Wittenberg, Germany. We just had Brother Castellol. He mentioned it there. He mentioned the same thing that I've been talking about for many times. And he talked about how the, the same thing that I said is that because uh, he was a missionary in Germany for years, and uh, he's seen that he's seen the I think he saw the Catholic Church that he uh, that he nailed the ninety five thesis to ninety five things wrong with the Catholic Church, yeah. And uh, so he uh, and he come out, and of course the Pope back then hated his guts, yeah. And he started the Lutheran Church, Martin Luther. All right, John Wesley started the Wesleyan Methodist in the 1700s. Charles and John Wesley were brothers, godly men that loved the Lord. They believed you could lose it. They were a little off under doctrine, but I mean, John Wesley believed you had to live it. You didn't live it, you ain't going to heaven. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but they're Methodists. They're good men. They're good men. And uh, but uh, they, uh, the Wesleys there, John Wesley, they started the Wesleyan Methodist Church. Martin Luther started the Lutheran Church. And those churches used to preach the gospel. Back a hundred years ago, the average sinner would go into a church. If they went into a Presbyterian church, the guy, you know, he uses their hyper Calvinist Presbyterians, you know, they'd at least preach the gospel. All right? Uh, they go into a Methodist church. You know, they could say, hey, Methodist preacher, get up there and say, you're going to burn in hell. You know, they would at least preach the gospel. Yeah. Back a hundred years ago, 200 years ago. But you go to meet a lot of these churches today, even a lot of so-called Baptist churches, you don't know what you're going to get. You, know? you might not get no gospel. You might get a bunch of baloney. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that, that's the way it was years ago. They, you know, they actually preach. And I mean, the center would get our conviction. You know, you go to another church, you know, and they'd stand up and say, you're going to go to hell if you don't get saved. And they might say, you can still lose it. They might be messed up on tongues or some other doctor or something like that, hyper-Calvinism or something like that. But Years and years ago, the last 40 or 50 years, yeah. uh, number seven is the Laodicean Church, apostate church. That's from about 1900 to the rapture. About 1900 to the rapture. And uh, so, eight, you know, the 1800s. I'm not trying to be mean. I know people get mad when I say this kind of stuff. It's the truth. You know, the 1800s was a great century for old-time revival and for missionary endeavors. But you know, the devil's always bringing the tares up and everything and to try to bring counterfeits and so forth. You, do you realize in the 1800s, the Jehovah's Witnesses were started? The Seventh-day Adventism started? The Mormons, the Mormonism started? And Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, and Thomas Campbell started the Church of Christ. It started out the Disciples of Christ, I believe. You can do a study on it. You can Google it and study. Thomas Campbell, uh, Barton Stone, and uh, Alexander Campbell. They used to call them Campbellites. They get very mad and upset when you say that. But, uh, they used to call them Campbellites. They believe in baptismal, baptismal regeneration. That baptism is a part of your salvation. And uh, so that all those started in the 1800s, 1820s to 1880 and through there. In the midst of all the great things that God was doing as far as revival. And uh, so uh, Laodicea is the apostate church, 1900. The rapture, the seven churches are divided into two groups of four in Revelation 2 and three in Revelation 3. The first and the fourth churches deal with works. The second and the sixth deal with trials and crowns. And the third and the fifth deal with names. There's seven churches there. So 
So the Laodicea, Laodicea means the rights of the people, starting in 1900. Yeah. And so you notice in the last 60 years, especially since the 50s and 60s, it's civil rights, the rights of the people. All right, everybody's got their rights. Everybody wants their rights. Yeah. All right, you got black people, white people. You got uh, the, the homos and the lesbians want their rights. Transgender want their rights. Yeah. Everything else. Did you know that Virginia has had the most executions as far as capital punishment of any other state? And they just voted the other day, their state people, late legislators and all that, they just voted the other day to abolish the death penalty. Yeah. And Ohio, they're in Columbus, Ohio is considering it, and they're about ready to do it here. If they can get enough votes. Ohio has put a lot of the death. One guy said there won't be no executions this year. They got everything on hold. All right. You say, well, I don't believe in capital punishment. Well, you don't believe the Bible then. Right. Capital punishment was instituted before the law in Genesis 9, 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, his blood shall be shed. All right. In Numbers 35, the murderer shall surely be put to death. And Paul, one of the greatest Christians that ever lived, submitted to capital punishment. He said, if I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Yeah. Acts 25, verse 10 and 11. You know why you put the murderer to death? Because Numbers 35, verse 31 to 33. Numbers 35, 31 to 33, says that the only way the land can be cleansed is to put the murderer to death. Yeah. You've got murderers running all over this country. And our president now, Biden, is getting ready, the Democrat Party is getting ready to allow 11 million at least illegal immigrants to come in through the southern border. MS-13 gang members will come in. All kinds of people will come in. Uh, they'll, the slave, uh, the children... Uh, uh, selling children for pornography and sexual things and all kinds of stuff. All the people will flood in through the uh, El Salvador, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, all through there. They're waiting to come in. They're all going to receive free this, free health care, free education, free food stamp, free this, free, free, free. And you say, who pays for it? You do, baby. <laughs> Said you have to get off on politics. Yeah, I do that every once in a while. Amen. <laughs> it just kind of makes me feel good once in a while. To do that. Uh, and uh, so you got uh, Laodicea, the apostate church, and uh, that's 1900 to the rapture. Rights of the people. Everybody wants their rights. Everybody's got rights except God. Yeah. Nobody cares about what God. When they consult, when they consult all these so-called experts on the capital punishment, the death penalty. When they talk about capital punishment, they never talk about what the Bible says about it. Yeah. They all talk about their human reasoning. Yeah. Dr. Smell Fungus says that we ought to do this and we ought to do that. Yeah. They never talk about what God says about it. Because yeah. they could care less. Yeah. All right, the next seven. Seven judgments. <coughs> I got a message I preached on this one. Uh, Brother Matt's probably got it back here on CD. The seven judgments... I go into more detail than I want to go into tonight. Number one, the judgment of sin at Calvary. The judgment of sin at Calvary. God, uh, Jesus Christ, bore the sins of every human being in this world. Yeah. All right, God put on him the sins of every human being. That's the judgment of sin at Calvary. For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In him, in Christ. If he may be in Christ, he's a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5.17. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him to be sin for us. He, made, he became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The only reason why Steve Kogel's going to heaven one of these days when he dies and kills over, whatever, is because June the 16th, 1977, I got on my knees and repented of my sins and received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Yeah. And I was born again. It has nothing to do with me being baptized. It has nothing to do with me joining a church. It has nothing to do with me having good works, if I have any. All right? It has nothing to do with anything that I've done in the past, that I'm doing in the present, or will do in the future. That I, that I have done or will not do, do or not do. 
It has to do with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only reason why I'm going. And when I did that, he gave me, he, he uh, gave me his righteousness. He, uh, he gave me his righteousness, uh, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only reason. That's judgment of sin at Calvary. God uh, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. So Christ came into the world and died on the cross, was buried, rose again. So that's a judgment of sin at Calvary. Secondly, the believer's daily self-judgment. The believer's daily self-judgment. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 30 to 32. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30 to 32. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged of the Lord. But when we are judged of the Lord, we are chastened that we should not be condemned with the world. That's what it says there. All right, so that's talking about communion, which we had a couple weeks ago there, uh, the Lord's Supper. And we had a time of exam uh, spiritual examination before we partook of it because we don't want to partake of it unworthily. Unworthily means you have unconfessed sin in your heart and life. So we got the believer's daily self-judgment. Now, we don't judge ourselves uh, because we, we're afraid we're going to die and go to hell. It's so we won't be chastened to the Lord. We won't he won't take us out to the woodshed and chasten us, you know, and chastise us. If you're saved, God doesn't deal with you as a sinner. He deals with you as a son. Yeah. All right. When God deals with the sinner, everything that happens in that person's life, it's God dealing with that sinner to get them to see their need for Calvary, for Jesus Christ as their Savior. Yeah. Yeah. When God deals with us, you and I, a Christian, if you're saved, he don't deal with you so you get saved. You're already saved. If you re repent and got saved, born again. All right. He doesn't do that. He does that to get you to rededicate your life and confess your sins yeah. to God. Yeah. All right, look at 1 Corinthians 11 there. And uh, let me show you uh, what it says, 1 Corinthians 11. And uh, <clears throat> this is the seven judgments, the judgment of sin at Calvary, Christ bearing our sins of everybody on this in this world, and the believer's daily self-judgment. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 30. For this calls many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. God took some of these Corinthian Christians home early. Sleep. They sleep. Took them home. They're weak, sickly. That doesn't mean that every Christian that, that is weak and sickly is not right with God. It just means some of these Corinthians that were not right with God. For Verse 31. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened to the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. See, when God judges you, he's judging you and chastising you to get you right with him so you rededicate being in fellowship with him again. That's nothing to do with you losing your salvation. It has to do with you staying in fellowship with the Lord. Yeah. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, 1 John 1, 10. Yeah. All right, so uh, then there's the... Uh, with believers daily self-judgment. <clears throat> in other words, every day I'm to confess my sins. To stay in fellowship. You want to keep short accounts with God. Yeah. You notice when dirt accumulates on something, like dirt will start accumulating on this here or anything, on you know, any, any type of surface or anything. If you let it go, then it gets it's get, gets it gets collects. It collects and more and more. And it gets gunky and it gets bigger and it just and after a while, it's harder, it's harder to get off there. That's the way sin is. As soon as that dust gets on there, you want to go like this. Watch this. Yeah. Yeah. Confess your, that's a picture of confessing your sins. Yeah. Lord, I, I shouldn't have said that. Lord, I shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry I was wrong. But when it keeps accumulating and accumulating, then that dirt just gunks. Yeah. That's the way sin is. So you want to keep short accounts with the Lord. Yeah. Uh, the believer's daily self-judgment. Thirdly, the third uh, judgment is the judgment seat of Christ for Christians. That's 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done. Things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. That's to Christians. That has nothing to do with unsaved people. Born-again Christians in America and around the world, a lot of them don't realize that 
People say, well, I'm saved. So I don't care about anything else. I, I know I'm going to heaven, so praise God, that's it. No, living for the Lord matters because we have to stand before the Lord. Yeah. Do you realize that one of these days you're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ in front of the Lord himself? That right there ought to knock your socks off. If you got socks on, amen. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14, 10. So that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That's in the context of the judgment seat of Christ. That's Romans 14. That's Romans 14, 12. In the context Romans 14, verse 10 and 12, the judgment seat of Christ. And then number four, the judgment of Israel in the tribulation. I just give you the verses. God judging Israel in the tribulation. It's uh, Hosea 2, 6 to 15. Hosea 2, 6 to 15. And Ezekiel 20, 38. There's a bunch of verses on that, but that's just a couple. Hosea 2, 6 to 15, and Ezekiel 20, 38. That's the judgment of Israel in the tribulation. Of course, there's a lot of verses in Isaiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah's full of it. And uh, the verses that deal with God judging Israel in the tribulation. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And then number five is the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25, 30 to 42. The judgment of the nations. God judging the nations. And... Uh, Look at Matthew 25. Let me show you a couple things over there on that. I was going to go to the next thing, but I think there's a couple things I want to bring out to you. Matthew 25. Uh, Matthew 25. And uh, verse 30. 31. Matthew 25, 31. The judgment of the nation when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. All right, uh, so this judgment here is uh, verse 31 to 46 is not the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment. All right, although a lot of people teach that. There are no Christians present, so it can't be the judgment seat of Christ. Besides, the judgment seat of Christ, the Christian's works are burned up, not him. All right, and we're going to see that these people here in Matthew 25, they're burned up. It can't be the great white throne judgment because there are no dead people present. The earth is still there with Christ's throne on it, and nobody is judged for many books. This is the judgment of the nations. And this is also recorded in Joel, Old Testament book, in Joel 3, <coughs> verse 1 to 14. And uh, the criteria is different for all three judgments. All right, Matthew 25, 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. All right, then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. See the millennium? Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Every do-gooder religion in the country and the world goes to these verses to say that if you don't do good and you don't give to the poor and you don't, uh, let's see here, you don't give to the hungry and you don't give to the thirsty and you don't give to the stranger, 36 naked and you clothed me, I was sick and you visited me, I was in prison, you came unto me, all right? Uh, all this here is millennial passages, second advent passages. This has nothing to do with a born-again Christian in the church age. Now, you, you can devotionalize this and spiritualize this and say, we ought to visit the sick and we ought to give to the hungry and those that are thirsty. You know, you can use the verses for that. You can spiritualize or devotionalize every verse in the Bible. Yeah. But doctrinally, and what is all Scripture given by inspiration for? For doctrine first. Yeah. Reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. So uh, you've got to get your doctrine right. But you, I can go to Leviticus. It talks about not eating certain birds and certain fowls of the air, and not eating the dietary laws in Leviticus and this that. I can take that. That's doctrine to Jews in the Old Testament. I can take something out of one of the verses there and bring a message and say, I want to bring, just like I did this morning, 1 Corinthians 13. Doctrinally, all that has a lot of different things going on there, and I didn't want to get into everything. We'd be here all day. We'd be here at 2 o'clock today. 
Uh, and I've gone over that in first by first study in First Corinthians. But I just wanted, wanted to bring that one thing when I was a child. I understood as a child and all that and bring a message, put away the toys. All right. But what I did is I spiritualized the verse. I spiritualized the verse and brought a sermon, put away the toys. All right. I can go to Leviticus or Genesis or Revelation or Joel or Amos or Obadiah or any part of the Bible and devotional. I have a devotion yeah. and bring spiritual application out of it for today in the church age. But doctrinally, you can't put a lot of those verses doctrinally, like these verses here. This is the millennium. Uh, uh, the, these are uh, the Lord gathers the nations and separates their citizens into two different groups. Uh, so, you know, it's it's a. I don't have time to teach all this. We'd be here all day. But, but I'll, let me go back to these seven, the seven uh, judgments, the uh, the judgment of the nations in Matthew twenty five thirty one to forty six. Then there's the great white throne judgment of the lost. That's in Revelation twenty verses eleven to fifteen. Paul said, I saw a great, or John said, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. You know what that's implied? The unsaved lost are suspended in midair. Yeah. You say, who are they held up by? God. Yeah. John said he saw this. He saw this in 90, 95 AD on the Isle of Patmos. He was in exile. God, he said, I was in spirit of the Lord's day, Revelation 1. God took him ahead 20 centuries. Yeah. Now, you know what these people that roll around on the floor and talk in tongues and everything, they say John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was in the spirit. He talked in tongues. It don't have nothing to do with talking in tongues. Talking in tongues isn't even mentioned in Revelation 1. Yeah. I was in the spirit of the Lord's day. God took him 20 centuries ahead and showed him all this stuff. And that's why John says a bunch of times, he showed me this all through Revelation. I saw this. I saw that. He showed me this. I saw that. John saw more. God revealed to Paul about the gospel. But you want to talk about the guy who saw a lot of stuff in the next 21 centuries? John. Yeah. Who is the disciple that Je it says the disciple whom Jesus loved five times in the Gospel of John. He's a picture of the church. Because at the Last Supper in John 13, all the disciples gathered there, they were eating there, the 12 apostles, and uh, Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And all the disciples said, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? John says, Lord, who is it? He knew it wasn't him. John was right next to Jesus. Jesus and John were pretty close. I mean, Peter is close to the Lord, Paul was, but John, that beloved disciple, John was right there. Jesus at the head of the table there. John was probably right here. Peter might have been right here. I don't know. But John was right there because I know that John was right here because it says in John 13 that John took his head and put it on the breast of Jesus Christ. He laid his head right here and felt the heartbeat and heard the heartbeat of God. That's a picture of where the church ought to be. Woo! We ought to shout and run the aisles. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. John, picture of the church, had his head right there. Yeah. The heartbeat of God. Yeah. Imagine that. And uh, so uh, he said, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great. Small and great. All the actors and entertainers and comedians, all the football, basketball, hockey players, all the great athletes making millions of dollars a year, all the presidents, vice presidents, senators, congressmen, mayors, governors of all the, all down through centuries. I saw the dead small and great stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. You know how many people have died at sea? And their bodies have never been recovered. But somehow, don't ask me how, because I'm not God. But somehow their bodies will be recovered. 
You say, who brings all those? If they got ate by sharks, I'm not trying to be gross. I'm just telling you the facts. I'm just telling you the facts here about life. My dad's ashes, he, was, he wanted to be cremated. My dad, my mother's got his ashes in a great big thing, very heavy. From the funeral home, we got it there a week or two, a week or two, well, last Friday, a week or Friday. And uh, down in Florida, he's got the ashes in there. Mom's got them there right on her living room. You say, how will all those ashes come together? God does it. Yeah. There have been people that have been burned in house fires. There are people that have been lost at sea. Sharks ate them. Chewed their bodies up. Yeah. All that type of thing. I saw the dead small and great. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake, cast into the fire. This is the second death, and the lake of fire, this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Yeah. Well, aren't you glad if you're saved, you're not going to be cast to a lake of fire? Amen. 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 Revelation 20, 11 to 15. I've said many times. I've burnt, the, I've burnt the tip of my finger on a hot stove or a coffee pot or something before or a plate of food or something that's hot out of the oven or something. And boy, I'll tell you what, all you want to do is get water and put it in water. Yeah. But there ain't, there ain't no water in hell. Yeah. Yeah. A man in Luke 16 said, I want one drop of water. They might cool my tongue or I'm tormenting this flame. There's no water. I got a message I preached here probably years ago. I think I preached it here. Some things not found in hell. No water. No flowers. You say flowers? Who cares about flowers? No nice shrubbery and landscaping flowers. No babies. They went to heaven. If they died as a baby. They're not accountable. I can forget how the message goes, but uh, the judgment, the white, the white throne judgment, Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15, and also in Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10. Talks about the books over there. Every time you find books, there's always a, that's always going to be the great white throne judgment. There's no books in the judgments. He doesn't say anything about judgment seeing books in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. The books are mentioned concerning the great white throne judgment. And then uh, last of all, the seven judgments is the judgment of angels at the white throne judgment. Do you realize that if you're saved, you're going to judge angels? You say, where's that at? 1 Corinthians 6.3. Uh, First Corinthians 6.2. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? That's 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2 and 3. You judge the world. You realize the great white throne judgment, there's, it says thousands, thousands ministered unto him. It says thousands, thousands were judged by him there. Those thousands, thousands ministered unto him, that has to be saints. And so a lot of, a lot of the so-called scholars commentators, they really believe, and I, I, I believe it. I believe that we are going to be at the great white throne judgment because thousands, thousands ministered unto him. It doesn't say they were angels. All right? it's, I believe it's us. Now, we've got our new glorified body then, but we might be at the great white throne judgment watching God cast people into hell, and you might watch some of your loved ones be cast into hell. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him in Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10 has to do with the great white throne judgment. And he says here, you put those verses in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2, know, know ye not that the saints shall judge the world? In verse 3, know ye not that we shall judge angels? I mean, you think about that. Your lost loved ones, you might watch God cast them into hell. Lake of fire. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. You think, you think about that. You see that? And so uh, that's, uh, that's the uh, judgment of angels, the white throne judgment. Now, we've got a few more minutes. Let me give you this real quick. Uh, there's seven churches of Satan. 
seven churches of Satan. So what do you mean? Well, there's the congregation of hypocrites, Job 15.34. Congregation of hypocrites, Job 15.34. There's the assembly of the wicked in Psalms 22.16. Assembly of the wicked. There's the congregation of evildoers in Psalms 26.5. There's the assemblies of violent men, Psalms 86.14. Then there's the synagogue of Satan, Revelation 2.9 and 3.9. Revelation 2.9 and 3.9 is the synagogue of Satan. There's an assembly of treacherous men. Jeremiah 9, 2. An assembly of treacherous men. Jeremiah 9, 2. And then number 7, there's the assembly of mockers. Jeremiah 15, verse 17. The assembly of mockers. Jeremiah 15, verse 17. So you got the congregation of hypocrites, Job 15, 34. The assembly of the wicked, Psalms 22, 16. The Congregation of Evildoers, Psalms 26.5. The Assemblies of Violent Men, Psalms 86.14. The Synagogue of Satan, Revelation 2.9 and 3.9. An Assembly of Treacherous Men, Jeremiah 9.2. And the Assembly of Mockers, in Jeremiah 15.17. Next seven. Seven crises after the fall of man in Genesis 3. There's seven crises after the fall. And there's a lot of crises, but these are the main seven crises. There's, uh, for number one is the flood. Number two is the Tower of Babel. Number three is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Those are all in Genesis. The flood is in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. The Tower of Babel is in chapter 11. And the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is in Genesis 19. Number four is the ten plagues in Egypt. That's in Exodus. The ten plagues in Egypt. And also in Exodus is the crossing of the Red Sea, Exodus 14. The crossing of the Red Sea. You say, that wasn't a crisis. Well, those Jews got down there to that water. It was a crisis to them until God opened up the water. Amen. Amen. That was one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. They went across on dry land. Yeah. Not only was it a miracle that God parted the Red Sea, and that's the, most, that's the thing that most preachers concentrate on and emphasize, but they went across on dry land. How could it be dry when it's a sea? The floor is water. I mean, the water is on the floor. Yeah. The mud or whatever. They went across on dry land. God had to dry it up because they went across on chariots. Yeah. And if it was wet, they would have got stuck. Woo! What a God we serve, baby. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Uh, the crossing of the Red Sea, number six. The destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. The destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. And then, of course, the crucifixion of Christ in Matthew 27, 50 to 53, where the veil in the temple is rent in twain. The veil of the temple rent in twain. Christ crucified. And uh, that was a crisis, but I'll tell you what, because of that crisis, you and I get to go to heaven. Amen. Amen. If you're repentant of your sins and receive Christ your Savior, right? Uh, got about five minutes here. Uh, the Holy Scriptures calls its contents by seven titles. The Holy Scriptures calls its contents by seven titles. In other words, the Bible is called the Word of Life, Philippians 2.16. The Word of Life, Philippians 2.16. The Word of God in Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. The words of the Lord are pure words, Psalms 12.6. The words of the Lord. The Scripture of Truth, Daniel 10.21. The Scripture of Truth, Daniel 10.21. And then the word of the Lord, 1 Peter 1.25, the word of the Lord endureth forever. This is the word of which whereby the gospel is preached unto you. 
the word of the Lord, 1 Peter 1, 25. And then the oracles of God. The Bible's called the oracles of God, Romans 3, verse 2. I mentioned that earlier. Oracles of God are committed to the Jews. That's Romans 3, verse 2. And then the Holy Scriptures calls its contents by another title, the Word of Truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Word of Truth. Yeah. So you got the Word of Life in Philippians 2.16, the Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, the words of the Lord, Psalms 12.6, the Scripture of Truth, Daniel 10.21, the Word of the Lord, 1 Peter 1.25, Oracles of God, Romans 3, verse 2, and the word of truth in 2 Timothy 2, 15. All right. Uh, and then you have seven baptisms of fire. Maybe these will stop. The seven baptisms of fire. Uh, in other words, there's seven times that the baptism of fire or literal, literal fire is rained upon people. First of all, you got Korah and Abiam going against Moses there and the religious leaders. I just, I just put down religious leaders. Numbers 16, 31 to 35. Numbers 16, 31 to 35. Religious leaders get the baptism of fire. God burns them up. And uh, of course, he calls an earthquake also and swallowed them up and fire. And then the city of Sodom and Gomorrah rained down, Sodom uh, fired brimstone. Genesis 19, 24. Genesis 19, 24, and also Jude 7 in the New Testament. The book of Jude. Jude, verse 7, uh, is the baptism of fire. And then the military, there's a military group, that, uh, baptism of fire, in 2 Kings 1, Verses 10 and 12. 2 Kings 1, verse 10 and 12. And uh, then the islands connected with fire, baptism of fire, and Ezekiel 39, 6. The islands, Ezekiel 39, 6. And then Jesus in type, uh, fire, uh, the land there in Exodus 12, 9, and 2 Chronicles 35, 13. Now, I know fire didn't literally devour Jesus. He died on the cross. But in type, in Exodus 12, 9, the lamb that's connected with, the lamb there is connected with fire. And so that's a picture of Christ. So it's kind of like a picture. Literally, Christ wasn't burned with fire, but there's a, there's a type there, is what I'm saying. Jesus in type. We'll say it like that, so we, I don't want you to think I'm teaching false doctrine. All right, uh, Jesus in type, Exodus 12, 9, and 2 Chronicles 35, 13. And then the baptism of fire on unsaved people, uh, the unsaved in Matthew 3, 11. <coughs> Matthew 3, 11, that baptism of fire has nothing to do with talking in tongues, rolling around on the floor, getting slain in the spirit. It has nothing to do with all of that. It has to do, if you receive the baptism of fire, you burn in hell. He talks about that in the context Matthew 3, verse 10 to 12, talks about unquenchable fire. You burn in hell, you get the baptism of fire. And then last of all, the world. The world's going to burn up. 2 Peter 3, 10. All right, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in all manner of conversation? Uh, uh, godliness. Uh, so seeing that all, all these things we can solve, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy manner of conversation of godliness? Looking forward and hasting to the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found with him in peace without spot and blameless. The whole world's going to melt with fervent heat. That's why you're not to love the world, be the things that are in the world. Mm -hmm. You're to set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Mm -hmm. All right.